The trap has changed, the routes have shifted, but almost always the goal has stayed the same. That's to get to the chicken, count up the green, collect the dead presidents, get to the thickets, get into the cheddar, the fetty. I could go on and on. But making money has always been the incentive for the trap. Moving products to one place from another and making money on marginal difference in cost and wholesale. And what city and region is absolutely overlooked when it comes to trapping? Well, that is my hometown of Seattle, Washington and the greater Pacific Northwest region in the United States of America. Now, this is a TTS or Trap Tree series episode, but it's actually a collaboration between my other series and that of High Design History. So in this TTS High Design History episode, we are going to cover the history and progression of Seattle's trappers and pushers in regards to this plant and how it has affected the current day. Because in a lot of ways, if we look below the surface, the trap is playing a major role in legal markets today and that of brand building and overall financial stability, while also educating and developing folks now operating in the legal market like myself. I personally got to see the end of the traditional market in Seattle and the rest of the state given I was working throughout Seattle's unregulated medical market and traditional market throughout all of high school in the Central District, attending Garfield High School. Now today in Seattle, the traditional market for flour has pretty much been extinguished and trappers have moved to other plays and other substances. But in this video, we are going to explore Seattle's tree trapping history and the different progressions of the trap in Seatown and around the state of Washington. Buckle up, this one's gonna get personal for myself and maybe some of y'all watching that are from the town. Please make sure to hit the like button, share this video, subscribe, and follow me on my social medias. The links are down below. Welcome to this Trap Tree High Design History episode. This is LMC. Let's run it. Typically, when people think of the history of smuggling here in the US, we tend to focus on our southern borders like California or Florida. But today, well, we're going to dive into the Pacific Northwest, specifically Seattle, and its rich history of trapping and how it evolved from its involvement in the counterculture movement during the 60s and 70s to the post rock grunge era into the current state we're in today. So, beginning in the mid 19th century, the first illicit products brought into the Pacific Northwest were introduced by immigrant Chinese workers. Cities like Portland and Seattle had large Chinese populations who migrated along with the expansion of the railroad system. And with these large Chinese populations came the Chinese owned and operated smoking dens. These dens didn't just attract Chinese workers, but American citizens as well. Dens were popping up all along the West Coast, including major cities like San Diego and Seattle, which prompted America's first ever, quote, war on illicit products. Though, as history has gone on to show, the type of policies created from these wars often translate to policies against minorities more so than policies against the formerly legal product themselves. For example, the Chinese uh, Exclusion Act of 1882 didn't just ban illicit imports, but it also banned any Chinese living in the US from becoming a naturalized citizen along with banning Chinese immigration altogether. While this law was written to last only a decade, it was renewed and made permanent 20 years later in 1902. Now, for the most part, there was no overlord or crime underworld that law enforcement was dealing with here, but were these dens still a trap? Absolutely. However, these were literally laborers and business owners who suddenly had their businesses banned and products deemed illegal. It wasn't until 1943 that the act was repealed just in time to get aid from the Chinese citizens in China itself to help fight against the Japanese in World War II. Now, the second war on illicit products in the Pacific Northwest would follow in the next century. The ban on the Chinese was lifted, but the war soon shifted its focus from the Chinese and their smoking dens to flour and new age hallucinogens. But one of the most important contributors to this rise of flour in the Pacific Northwest was actually the war in Vietnam. See, the counterculture movement, which we will go deeper into later, was on the rise as protests against the Vietnam War became more and more popularized with the youth. Eventually, this led to thousands leaving cities like Seattle and other northwestern areas of the US to move away into Canada, particularly British Columbia and the San Juan Islands. The San Juan Islands became the home of large quantities of production of world popular flavors like Northern Lights, which is a flavor built for harsher climate of the islands in the Pacific Northwest. See, by the 1970s, these islands became a hotspot for cultivation and smuggling alike. The Pacific Northwest plethora of waterways, inlets, and islands make it a haven for traffickers. Now, over time, the proximity of British Columbia or BC to Washington began to play a major role in the smuggling landscape of Seattle and the Pacific Northwest. The cultivation techniques from the early counterculture movement have been passed on and spread like wildfire. 
bringing in more opportunity for criminal organizations to tap in and handle the distribution. But while sharing knowledge and information helps push a community forward, this watered down effect of passing along growing techniques to anyone and everyone led to the cultivation of much lower quality bud and typically grown up with little care and left to the elements. Now, the quality of this, of this flower eventually came to be known as beasters. So some think of beasters as Canada's mids, but in reality, it's likely that anything called beasters was simply outdoor herb from anywhere along the Canadian border and the Pacific Northwest. It was good marketing for your, you know, your dealer to say this flower came all the way from Canada just because, well, it sounded special. But in reality, it was just readily available in large quantities, which made it more affordable to flip, especially if you added an extra surcharge for international goods, right? The good stuff. Now, that doesn't explain the high reputation the Pacific Northwest has for their high quality cultivation. Eventually, traditional market flowers started improving their quality from this area due to legalization and the development of prominent cultivars and bean banks. In 2001 marked the beginning of medically legalized flower in Washington. This convinced many growers and dealers to convert from traditional market to the legal industry, kind of. But now, indoor operations were becoming more common with players like DJ Short developing flavors and focus more on the sweet and flavorful side rather than the typical spice you would get from outdoor Afghan phenotypes like Northern Lights. Flavors like DJ Short's Blueberry proved there were more to the plant than the high and the popularity of new hybrid blends, grown with more favorable conditions indoors, producing no new flavors and aromas not previously experienced by enthusiasts. In fact, this was the beginning of the new age connoisseur in the market. A flower like this could be charged at a premium in the traditional market at $60 or more for your typical 3.5 G's instead of your $20 to $40 for beasters. Now, we head into the golden era. Still, this new era of legalization that has assisted the traditional market in producing high quality product in larger quantities is probably considered by most organized crime as the post golden age of smuggling in the Pacific Northwest. Long before the spread of beasters, there was something else spreading across the country, particularly in states within the Pacific Northwest. This was during a time of cultural experimentation, and America's youth were ready to change mainstream values and were open to an alternative lifestyle in an effort to avoid conformity. The counterculture scene was met with societal challenges and negative stereotypes of illicit use. This also captured the attention of organized crime looking to capitalize by providing flour and other illicit products to its members and the broader community. Gangs of this era had a multifaceted approach in infiltrating the Pacific Northwest and communities alike, typically presenting themselves as something other than violent or ruthless, but instead as a group of rebels fighting against the established world order to support the counterculture. See, the counterculture provided both customers and future members that helped to spread these networks. However, the infiltration tactic would not only be used by these gangs, but also by our own government. So the FBI's counterintelligence program, aka COINTELPRO, was formed to infiltrate groups to monitor activities and in some cases have promoted or engaged in illegal activities. Due to the nature of this program, it was dismantled in 1971. Now you could also argue that that's back again, but that's for another video. But however, these organizations like the Black Panthers had been wrecked by efforts to crush the counterculture and minority movements, many of which had turned to illicit trafficking to further fund the movements themselves. And unfortunately, after these organizations slowly dissipated, society was left with an open market, making room for criminal organizations to fill the void. With this cycle, we see the devastation of minority groups and communities, the proliferation of organized crime, followed by the gentrification of these areas with minorities being pushed out. Now, sometimes we don't notice the less fortunate in society. Sometimes their stories aren't really heard until it directly affects someone we know, like a friend, a family member, or in this case, a celebrity. The counterculture movement had progressed into the 1990s, once again revolutionizing pop culture with music. This behind the lead singer of Nirvana, Kurt Cobain. Between 1986 and 1992, overdose or related people passing away rose by 84%, with the record levels having been surpassed only six months into the following year at the time of that study from the Harborview Medical Center. Although his passing was not attributed to an overdose, it was noted in his autopsy that he had fresh needle marks in his arm with, with high concentrated dose in the system. His passing opened the eyes to the rest of the nation to what was going on in Seattle's illicit market and had reached beyond the streets and into the homes of listeners through MTV. 
When the music scene took off in Seattle, Bob Timmons, a former addict turned counselor for rock stars, recalls being recruited to work with six musicians from three different bands, all of which were using the same substance found in Kurt Cobain when he passed at the age of 27. Mary Truscott, the advertising manager of American Music, which was an equipment and repair shop for major bands in Seattle during the 90s, said that Seattle's most popular illicit substance at that time existed at all levels of the music business. It exists in the clubs, it exists on all levels from the most desperate, hard scrabble, trying to be rock star band, on up to the successful bands even. She goes on to say that white stuff had fallen out of favor as Cobain and the rest of the Seattle's grunge scene, substance of choice, was the exact opposite of that, the brown. Falling more in line with the vibes of the counterculture of that period compared to the charged up decade of the 80s. All that being said though, former label owner Daniel House of CZ Records would emphasize that the reality is that flour and alcohol are more, most prevalent in the music industry. Jeff Gilbert, a writer for Guitar World magazine at the time, agreed, pointing out, quote, there's an impression that everyone here is strung out on the hard stuff. That's not true. If anything, they're all a bunch of flower heads. And if you're a flower head, you need to check out our friends over at GetSeedsRightHere.com. If you're looking for amazing prices for high quality beans and cuts of flavors, go over to GetSeedsRightHere.com and get high quality beans and cuts for a great price. Let's jump back into it. Now, in modern times, the smugglers have become smarter, their technology has become better, and their products have become more potentially dangerous. Instead of vertical hierarchies that can be infiltrated and lead to the complete collapse of an entire criminal organization, they have leaned more towards a horizontal structure by distributing their network across channels, including working with other criminal organizations rather than against one another. Instead of hidden compartments on boats and vehicles, they have evolved into semi-submerged and fully submerged vessels equipped with anti-detection and navigation software. Typically, these are third-party contractors used by cartels like the Jalisco New Generation Cartel or the CGNG. According to an article on justice.gov in 2020, an 18-month investigation ended in the arrest of an alleged member of the CJNG cartel in Seattle. They discovered over 50 pounds of illicit product in addition to over 3,000 synthetic pills, 22 firearms, and half a million in cash. The new powerful synthetic pills that have hit the market have been involved in 70% of the overdose people passing away in Seattle, King County area. It comes full circle as these illicit synthetic products are actually derived from the original natural products that came in from back in the 19th century, but many times more addictive and potentially deadly. Now let's come full circle. Still, that hasn't meant that they haven't given up on natural products by any means. See, the rise of the 2012's recreational market in Seattle and across the Pacific Northwest has in a sense given some a false badge of courage with prosecutors describing a string of Chinese defendants they've come across as folks that quote, maybe thought they wouldn't get in that much trouble if they got caught doing it. It appears that the word has spread, that it's a good business to get into, so people go into it, which was a quote from Grays Harbor County Chief Criminal Deputy Prosecutor Jason Walker. In May of 2018, coordinated raids between King and Pierce counties focused on homes with unusually high electric bills. For example, a two-month bill of $2,500 and a three-month bill for $37,000. They ended up seizing over 3,000 plants, all from a single Chinese family with the defendants being a married couple and the husband's brother. Now, typically, these are families trying to take advantage of the legal market by selling into non-legal states in their traditional markets for twice or even four times the price in Washington at the time. The defendants they've come across range anywhere from between 20-somethings to late 60s, both male and female, further painting the picture of individual family-orientated businesses rather than coordinated organized crime syndicates. Some have lived in the country long enough to have become naturalized citizens, while others even have their green cards. We're talking single men, married couples, and even families with children. Now, that's not to say that there is not organized crime involved with this. We'll talk about that a little bit later on in this video. But Pierce County Deputy Prosecutor John Sheeran points out that, quote, this is not a violent group looking to defend their property in any kind of violent way. This is a money-making venture. This is a conspiracy to make money illegally, end quote. According to Sheeran, a lot of the defendants moved here from somewhere back east based on the license plates, driver's licenses, and even plane tickets that had been recovered. Now, this is very true. See, growing up in Seattle, I was personally heavily entrenched in Seattle's medical markets and was lucky enough to operate in them during the second half of my high school years. 
I attended Garfield High School, located in the Central District of Seattle, where I was able to take part in the medical market as well as the traditional market, given that the medical markets on the West Coast were extremely unregulated and free for really anyone to take part that had a medical card written for them by a doctor. The medical markets became even more relaxed when in 2012, Washington and Colorado decided to legalize the plant recreationally, which started what I call a limbo period, where there was no police enforcement due to the fact that the recreational market had not officially opened yet. Typically, it takes anywhere from like two to five years, right, on average. Now, being that Washington was the first state alongside Colorado to have this limbo period of really lax laws, well, folks from all over the country would fly into Seattle to purchase high quality flour for extremely good prices in comparison to their home regions across the country. So this leads me and a good friend of mine to start working for gray market medical delivery companies advertising on Craigslist during high school. And by the end of the last year of high school for me, we were running our own delivery service, also being advertised on Craigslist where we served all types of people from all walks of life, high quality flower. But even before rec was available, we had people in Seattle like Eric, an illicit Craigslist flower peddler from the early 2000s. Around that time, Jeff Eag of Seattle's DEA office said the amount of illicit transactions that occur online isn't enough to go after those marketing on the early social media sites of MySpace, LiveJournal, and Friendster, but instead focus on online pharmacies that sell illegal prescriptions to people without prescriptions for those products at high profit margins. In 2004, Seattle voters approved an initiative requiring police to make enforcement of possession their lowest priority by making less than 40 grams a misdemeanor. So by 2005, Eric, who was confidently pushing his product online, felt he had no real concern when he told his story to the Seattle Times. He would go on to talk about his customers felt more at ease connecting online instead of on the streets, kind of foreshadowing what would happen with Ross Albright and the Silk Road, but that's for another video. And besides that, none of these dealers were afraid of any sort of legal consequence from either the government or the sites that they were using for business at the time. Perhaps it was because of this Eric went as far as to post that he was willing to trade for favors from women or the traditional money from men or even men who offered their women he would give a discount. <laughs> now, that's not exactly the process I had in mind with what I was doing. See, and this was also a lot later on. This is almost 10 years from then. And I remember as a high schooler driving every other day during lunchtime down to SeaTac Airport where I would link up with folks from all over the country. As long as they had a medical card, well, I would serve them. And as a Washington State medical card holder, we were legally allowed to have up to 24 ounces of flour at any given time. Yet that didn't really stop any of us from bringing more weight. Now, if people who flew into SeaTac Airport were to buy a five pack or a 10 pack or a 20, well, I had no idea what they were gonna do with it and really, it was none of my business. Now, if we had to speculate, I'm sure most of these folks either wrapped them up in the mail or drove them back to their home state so they could triple or even quadruple their profits. Now, those were folks flying in from all over the country, but when it came to the neighboring states, well, typically the methodology for smugglers looking to bring work back from Washington was the caravan style. A number of big smuggling groups in Idaho, Montana, and other states would drive in five, eight, maybe 10 cars, creating a caravan where they would come into Seattle, link up with a grower or a trapper like myself, and we would help source anywhere from 20 to 500 units. I remember having to drive all over the state for one or two days straight, trying to source enough product for their orders. I drive down to Olympia, pick up 15 units here. I drive up to Bellingham to get 20 units here. I drive to Monroe to get another 10 here and to Tacoma to get another 20 there. Now, all of these people in these caravans would be medical patients, so technically it was all above board. But now, if I had to guess when these caravans had packed up their cars, they would travel back to places like Idaho and Montana and would have a driving system where three cars in the middle of the caravan would have all of the product in it. And then there would be two in the back that was there to make sure that they were dummy cars. Meaning that if a cop was to be driving behind the caravan, one of the two cars in the back would start driving recklessly to get the cop to pull them over. So to let the caravan and the cars content, the actual product continue on its journey back home, evading law enforcement. The caravan would also have a scout car that would drive far ahead to alert the rest of the caravan if there were any cops ahead and for them to be cautious. Now, like I said, I'm not sure if that was the case because really once me and growers I worked with sourced product for them in state, we really had no idea where it was going. That was just a guess, right? 
But really, I was very lucky to experience the last of an amazing era, where Seattle was one of the main destinations for folks around the country, right behind Denver and the state of California, given that the medical market was so unregulated, as well as the announcement that Seattle and the state of Washington was the first state to legalize for recreational use. Now, if you haven't seen the video I did on the Chinese Mafia and the bubble flavors, I highly recommend you check that out to help give you more context in this current video you are watching now. But really, starting in the early 2000s, the production of illicit products like flour and harder substances started to move away from large-scale production, usually located in rural areas, to being more placed within the urban regions, closer to buyers and larger, more dense populations. In Seattle, we saw the boom of Chinese and Vietnamese trap grows explode. Back during my high school years, neighborhoods in Seattle like Bay Geek and Hill and Skyway were known to have many of these trap grows, where there would be a cluster of houses scattered throughout each neighborhood, where 5 to 20 light grows would be operating. These trap grows were more decentralized, like I mentioned earlier, with it being more horizontal, making it nearly impossible for law enforcement to fully stamp them out. These trap grows, for example, in Beacon Hill would insulate the house to prevent too much of an odor, and the growers operating them would steal power from neighboring houses to disperse and therefore camouflage the grow from being found out. Given that law enforcement typically would scan the city's power grid to see if there was any houses using an abnormal amount of electricity like I mentioned earlier, which then would put them on law enforcement's radar to be further investigated if they had a uh, abnormal you know, electrical charge. Now, in the first half of my high school career, I typically dealt with mainly Vietnamese. Now, the Vietnamese were some of my favorite people to work with given their high quality and typically competitive pricing. But by the end of my high school career and after that, I started to deal with more and more Chinese nationals. I had no problem with it because, well, their prices were even more competitive. Although maybe the quality was a bit lower in comparison with the Vietnamese growers I originally would work with. But as time went on, I started to see more and more Chinese trap grows, and while this is just a microcosm of a larger trend happening in not just Seattle, but all over the PNW and the West Coast. With the migrations of, from the Chinese in these illegal markets into early recreational markets of the Pacific Northwest came the devastation of the communities these growers and dealers cultivated and ran their business in. Their ability and willingness to make full cash payments on their properties would drastically distort the real estate markets they resided in raising the cost of the homes around them, pushing out any new home buyer prospects from those areas and replacing them with a family or individuals with vastly higher income or businesses looking to convert property into their own commercial real estate. However, Operation Green Jade was a 2017 bus that had federal agents trace money transfers from China that provided the cash used to get out the and convert over 20 homes into grow houses. In cases like this, the DA, assistant special agent in charge in Seattle, Russ Byer, says, quote, We've seen no indication of any government affiliation. It's traditional organized crime, Chinese syndicates that are profiting, end quote. This also reveals that many of the Chinese involved were victims having been trafficked, resulting in their release without being charged. And like I said, go check out that video that I did a few months ago or like six months ago regarding this specific topic about the Chinese mafia. However, beyond these neighborhoods and communities lies a forgotten wasteland that has existed since the 1930s. And this is truly a really crazy, crazy place and story. See, this is a place that consistently bred its own breed of dealers. The East Duwamish Greenbelt, AKA the jungle, is a place marked by its homelessness and criminal activity. In 2016, with two people passing away, and the third wounded sparked an outcry that would put a spotlight on these so-called hobo jungles, end quote, that began spreading out from Seattle's Hoovervilles, the rundown towns put together by the homeless during the Great Depression. Now fast forward back to the year 2000, we have what is now become known as the jungle. And the jungle is this massive place, you can see it by the highway, like cops don't even go into this place, it's that crazy. In the year 2000, right, only a 14 year old named Sun Tran would move there coming from a broken home working in a sweatshop in the basement of his drunken father. Since the age of eight, he worked as soon as he would get home from school till nine or 10 at night. The same year he would enter the jungle would be the same year he began his journey to become considered the king of the jungle. After having been convicted of assault and kidnapping, he has served time in state prison, still having yet to ever work an actual job. He wrote in letters to the court that this had become his escape 
and with his release in 2012, he had gotten his girlfriend pregnant and saw this as his means to support his family saying, quote, I told myself that this time it was different because I wasn't doing it to support my habit. This time I was doing it to support who I cared for, end quote. He goes on to paint a picture that speaks to the word trap saying, quote, I know this sounds crazy, but that is what I thought at the time. I now know that what I was doing was actually very destructive to my family and I would do anything to go back in time and make better decisions. I don't know how everything occurred so fast, end quote. Tran was finally arrested again April 2015 after years of investigating informants and wiretaps. Investigators found Tran's organization moved more than 60 pounds of illicit product each month. That's almost a bag of concrete. And we're talking about the hard stuff, right? But in the words of Brent Harp, his defense attorney, quote, Mr. Tran didn't create the jungle. The jungle created Mr. Tran, end quote. Now, the current market for illegal flour in Seattle and around the state is now dead. These trap grows are still operating, but really they are strictly being operated to serve other markets where flour is still illicit. In fact, the sales for legal flowers actually dropped in 2022 for the first time since recreational became available in 2012. It was an 8% drop, totaling over $40 million. However, Brian Smith of the Washington State Liquor and Flower Board attributes this to sales simply returning to normal growth in comparison to the spike seen during the pandemic. A flower data firm, Headset, found this to be aligned with the fact that all sales across the legal states have been in decline that began in July of 2021. Another Washington study found that the average person spent at the dispos were around 34 dollars and 14 cents in july of 2021 to 31 dollars and 41 cents in july of 2022 in addition to finding that across all markets some visits decline even more so than purchase amounts still signs point to this being a correction rather than a reversal as 2022 still brought in more revenue than all previous years other than 2021 which was obviously the pandemic now to jump to the future right Meanwhile, lawmakers have stepped in to try to combat the war on these illicit products in an entirely new way. Governor Jay Inslee signed SB 5476 into law in February 2021, similar to Seattle's 2004 initiative giving individuals the ability to possess controlled substances and having it treated as a misdemeanor instead of a felony. We're seeing that lawmakers are looking for alternative solutions without targeting or heavily penalizing the individual. However, in 2010, City Attorney Pete Holmes had fought to uphold Seattle's Department of Public Defense's policy of releasing repeat offenders into social services or let go altogether without sentencing. During this time, Seattle has seen increased crime rates with a 20% increase in violent crime between 2020 and 2021. Shootings and shots fired increased by 40%. Still, it will be interesting to see how things play out in Seattle and the rest of the Pacific Northwest. Will these loose laws eventually find a way to help these individuals while bringing down the overall crime rate? Or will things continue in their current trajectory? Right? I think we're hitting all time highs in Seattle for crime in the last like 20 years. Anyways, before we wrap up the video, I just want to remind y'all to go check out our friends over at GetSeedsRightHere.com. If you're looking for amazing prices for high quality beans and cuts of flavors, go over to GetSeedsRightHere.com. Get high quality beans and cuts for a great price at GetSeedsRightHere.com. Now let's jump back into it. So in conclusion, I think Seattle and the PNW, the Pacific Northwest, is absolutely one of the most overlooked regions when it comes to the trap, jugging, and the boys. But trust me, there is a rich culture of it here. I'm not glorifying it, but when we talk about the four corners of the United States and that of New York, Florida, Cali, slash Texas, and then Washington, well, there is inherently a concentration of smugglers giving a number of variables. One of the biggest just being geographically in well Seattle is the main city in the Pacific Northwest region of the country, and therefore a major hub for smugglers. As Seattle's population increases, well, we'll see the trap expand as well as with harder substances, unfortunately. Anyways, this is just a breakdown of the history of trapping in Seattle and the greater Pacific Northwest region. I want to give you a little insight into my hometown, my home state, and what's going up here and going on up here in the Pacific Northwest. Let us know down in the comments which city or region do you want us to cover next. And also make sure to join the Discord, follow me on Twitter, Instagram, and all the other social medias. Also, make sure to subscribe, hit the like button, and share this video. Shout out to all the trappers, hustlers, and juggers. Make sure you're looking to use the trap as a stepping stone to legitimate entrepreneurship. Don't get trapped in the trap. Also, shout out to the North, South End, CD, 
and west and everywhere else in Seattle and beyond. Anyways, I really appreciate y'all for listening and making it to the end of this video. This is LMC, signing out.